So we have learned that we have to be careful in transforming the electric and magnetic fields from one frame to another because they constitute the components of a second rank anti-symmetric tensor which mathematically means that they have to transform like the product of two contravariant four vectors <coughs> because there are two indices each index is like the, the index of a four dimensional contravariant vector therefore okay let me write a statement I'm not going to prove this for you some of you might have already seen it in certain special relativity courses so F mu nu transforms transforms like the product of two contravariant four vectors under Lorentz transformations. So for that reason the transformation the trans uh, transformation equations from one frame to another for E and B for the zero I and I J components of the F mu nu can be written in that rather complicated looking form. Let me check my notes because these type of things cannot be remembered by heart. So it is gamma E plus beta, beta is the famous beta, times cross B minus gamma squared over gamma plus one beta beta dot E that is how the electric field in the transformed frame, moving frame that is, and that's the transformed expression for the E and I have to write now the B prime as well gamma times B minus B cross beta cross E minus gamma squared divided by gamma plus one beta beta dotted into B. You see how nice, <laughs> well actually I'm joking it's nice, it's complicated, right, quite complicated. What you have E and B in one frame uh, and what you have uh, as E and B in the other frame are uh, related to each other through this complicated set of relations. Let me remind you the gamma. Gamma is the famous Einstein gamma, the beta squared. And you remember what beta is, V over C, it's the relative speed. So it's indeed complicated. So that also shows the e, how intermingled E and B are. Actually, e, when e, Maxwell has written his equations in 1870s, I don't give a precise date because these things do not happen overnight, right? Because this man probably was working on it for many years and he combined all those previously known laws of electric, electricity and magnetism and, and apparently Faraday has a quite an important uh, position in those things. He, when he brought all these phenomena in the form of a set of equations called Maxwell's equations, he was really unifying electricity and magnetism. So therefore, what is known to be electricity and magnetism before that has become electromagnetism and that's the first unification in the history of science. You know, some of you may know probably there is this important unified field theory is nowadays a, a portion of it is called standard model is at the heart of today's research. The, some great minds also have worked on till their death like Einstein. He wanted to, to unify many other things together but this is the first unification and it's considered to be a great achievement in the history of science. So then you have Newton Galileo and then Maxwell and that's at the turn of the century from 19 to 20 
that was a great achievement. Well, this also reflects the fact that what you see as an electric field in one frame may look like magnetism in another frame. That's indeed a unification, really. So you don't you have to be very careful. And these laws is also a good reflection of that important phenomenon. Now, in the, I have erased the picture. The K is the, K is, the nucleus frame, nucleus rest frame, or proton rest frame, let's make it proton rest frame. And K prime is electron rest frame. So in the proton's rest frame, you have E, which is the Coulomb E, and B equals zero. So you have only electric field. Let's see what we have in the electron's rest frame. So if we set B equals zero in here, to take that into account, if B is equal to zero, what you have is gamma E minus gamma squared divided by gamma plus one, beta, beta dotted into E. It is a, an interesting relation. Obviously, there is a gamma in the front. Perhaps I can rewrite this slightly differently in the index notation. So I'm not going to write equal. I'll say, if you consider the E prime ith component of it, it's going to be gamma delta ij minus gamma divided by gamma plus one beta i beta j times ej. Now, the, let's take them as Cartesian indices. Now, i and j in the three-dimensional, I take the Cartesian indices. Therefore, I don't have to put them up or down. i and j means x, y, z, Cartesian. I. Therefore, there's no confusion. Look at this for the form of this equation. There is a one, order one expression. And there is gamma one divided by one plus gamma, but there is a beta squared correction in principle, right? All beta squared. And gamma itself is quite small because beta is small, right? At the order of alpha. Now, how nicely related beta and alpha are of the same order? Alpha we know, 137. One over 137. So this is how the E's are related. Notice that apart from a factor of that sort, E, E goes to E. But we, I have to think about the gamma in here and keep track of the orders. I will do that. And what kind of correction that E gets to lowest order? First order in beta or second order? Well, we can immediately answer that. Let me, let me finish that first before turning my attention to magnetic field. Because the presence of this here, gamma, may upset you a little bit. Or at least in the right hand side, the leading order is E times the gamma. And notice that I am retaining the first orders in beta. Therefore, let's check the gamma. What happens to the gamma? Gamma is 1 minus beta squared to the minus a half, right? That's the Einstein gamma. If I expand this to leading order, 1 plus beta squared over 2. So it picks a correction to second order in gamma. So if you retain only the corrections to first order in the E and B, then we are going to drop this. And obviously that's also second order, so this times that is fourth order. There is the second order and fourth order, etc. So to leading order, E prime is E to leading order and the correction starts at the second order. That's an important phenomenon. So what I'm trying to say is that even the E is corrected, E is modified. Not only that there is a B emerging from nowhere, out of nowhere, because in the original frame there was no B, but when you are taking this into account to modify the equations, you have to also check whether your E is modified or not to the same order. Thanks God it's not, otherwise I have to take that into effect as well. When you read the book, sometimes they overlook at it. They treat this as a trivial matter. It's not a trivial matter, so you have to really indeed check that. So let me proceed with the B. 
because that is the new element which is going to give us something interesting. So if I put the fact that B was zero in the original frame, so what do I get from here? Notice that that first term goes away, so is this third term, and there is only the second term in that expression, so B prime is equal to minus gamma times beta cross E. How nice or how terrible, depending on the way you are looking at it. So in this new frame, there is a magnetic field. So perhaps I have to encircle these expressions, which are the expressions associated with the correct physical situation. That is, in the nucleus, in the proton's rest frame, there was only a Coulomb electric field, and therefore they lead to this modified electric field, a new magnetic field. All of a sudden, a magnetic field popped in. Aha, uh -huh. once you have a magnetic field, you remember the fact that your electron carried a spin. That's an experimental discovered fact, right? Electron carries an additional quantum number called spin, which is intrinsic angular momentum. Intrinsic because even you stop the electron, it carries that angular momentum, because the orbital angular momentum is there only when it's moving. When there is no motion in principle, no, not in principle, there is no orbital angular momentum. But when it's stopped, it carries that spin, so it's going to interact with the magnetic field. Spins are good probes for the magnetic fields. Electric charges are good probes for electric fields. Masses are good probes for gravitational fields. These are all probes, right? How do you detect whether there is a field existing here? You put a charge, and if it is pushed, then you say, of course, there's a force acting on it. There must be electric field. How do you know there's a magnetic field? You send an object carrying a magnetic moment. If it is deflected, then you say it, there is magnetic field in that region. Good. So once this presence of this B prime is discovered, then our electron is going to have an additional interaction energy in addition to the Coulomb potential energy, right? That's there already because it carries a charge. There's an electric field. Therefore, there's a minus E squared over R. And as we have shown that the electric field is not modified to leading order beta, it's modified only to beta squared order, B drop. The electric field is the same as before, thus Coulomb potential energy is the same as before, and there is a new additional magnetic interaction energy, which as you quite know, well know, it is minus mu times the B, the magnetic moment is the mu. Okay, so what is the consequences of further consequences of this. Let me work this out uh, as fast as possible before. Okay. So what is the, again, I have to resort to experiment again. Electron was Tengerlach and the Uhlenbeck. They say that if electron carries a spin, there's a magnetic moment associated with this. It is minus g times e divided by 2mc. G is the so-called gyromagnetic ratio. It is a physical phenomenon. Uh, and uh, when we move into relativistic quantum mechanics in the second part of this course, uh, you'll see that all these things will have a certain meaning in the context of the correct relativistic quantum mechanical equation, which is called the Dirac equation. But till now, uh, at this level, we have to take it as a phenomenological relationship. Well, why I spend a few minutes on that? Because really some of these things have a semi-classical background. For example, if you have a current loop, Q, 
moving with the speed v, then you can work out the relationship between the magnetic moment this loop carries. How do you know it's a magnetic moment? If you look at the magnetic field far away from here, it behaves, its field, magnetic field is like the field of a magnetic dipole. Then you can see that the relationship between that dipole and the angular momentum is given by this Q over MC. You just work it out. Angular momentum is easy, right? Because this is the radius or cross MV and you can work out the also the magnetic moment and you find that there is a relationship of that sort. Well it looks very much like that. There is a minus because charge is Q is minus E intrinsically and there is MC so this portion is okay and there is a 2 well that, that, that 2 is of course it is making it intrinsically quantum mechanical. It is the difference from that old semi-classical argument. Okay. Now let me skip some of these. Let me move still. So this is the energy. So let me for the B I have to use this relationship, but that relation is exact. Well, sorry, I have to modify this. This is the B in the rest frame of the electron, so I have to put the proper label. There was no B in the K frame. There's only a B in the K prime frame, so it must be this B. This is an exact expression, but notice that here is gamma. Gamma is an approximate expression which can be expanded as I have indicated. 1 plus beta squared over 2. Of course, there could be a higher order term, but leading corrections is second order. And there is another beta in here. So if I write B prime now as exactly yet, minus gamma times beta and the unit vector in the direction of beta to make it as dimensionless as possible, is this is a unit vector that carries the dimension of the electric field as before and the order of beta now is gamma times beta. So if I compute that, what is the gamma times beta? The leading order it is beta plus beta cube over 2. So that complicated thing, gamma beta is to be replaced by beta because the next order correction start at the beta cube order, we drop it. Because in approximation there is a systematics, there is a complex constant in, in terms of which you expand and you keep track of the orders that you are computing all the, model, all the corrections to at each physical level and they need to be consistent. Therefore, this expression now is, as an approximation, is minus beta magnitude times unit vector, I put back the beta, beta cross E. Nice, isn't it? So uh, I have a B prime magnetic field which is in terms of the original Coulomb field in the protons rest frame is minus beta cross E. So I am more or less prepared to compute that additional energy due to electrons spin. Okay, so let me compute that. So I replaced it with this approximate expression minus beta cross E. Now E is the Coulomb, there's no problem about that, the original Coulomb. So this becomes, this is an approximation, therefore mu dotted into beta cross E, beta is V over C. And what about the mu? Oh, here I forgot to, I'm really sorry. 
I was writing the relationship between the magnetic moment and the spin. If there's spin, it, there's magnetic moment and vice versa. But I forgot to write that down there, so it is uh, to be included, of course. So this mu is minus g e divided by 2 mcs. So I can uh, rewrite it further as minus g e over e mc. M, m, is, m is the mass of the electron, of course. It's not anything else. So I have the s dotted into v over c cross e. I will do several manipulations in here. What the first thing is that I multiply this with m, the mass of the electron. Of course, I have to compensate that. And mass times the velocity is the momentum. Therefore, this becomes minus g e over 2 m squared c squared s dotted into p momentum cross e. You see, through these rather simple and semi-classical arguments, we are moving in the right direction of obtaining that uh, famous spin orbit interaction term, provided that I remember what E was. E is the Coulomb field, right, of the positively charged nucleus. It is moving outward. Therefore, it is E over R squared times R units, right? Potential is plus E over R. The electric field is E over R squared. And the effect of the electron's charge being negative is already taken into account in the relationship between mu and S by putting an additional minus sign. So if I put that expression there, what do I have? So let me convert this into full vectors, writing it E over R squared, R cubed times R. That's a unit vector, right? One over R squared. So what happens to the delta H now after this explicit expression? It is now G times E squared divided by twice m squared c squared. But this additional square came from the field of Coulomb field of the nucleus. So s dotted into p cross r. OK. p cross r is minus the orbital angular momentum, right? r cross p, p cross r. So, and of course there is, let, not, let, let me not forget that R cube, R cube. So we have then minus G E squared divided by 2 M squared C squared S dot L divided by R cube. That portion is okay. S dot L divided by R cube. If you want, at some point we may check dimensions because what you do always should be consistent. Mathematically consistent, physically consistent. And we'll do that perhaps in a moment, but let me finish this uh, expression, this computation, by remembering the phenomenological fact that G equals 2, that's an experimental, you know, fact, gyromagnetic of the electron, ratio, gyromagnetic ratio of the electron as measured is 2. If you substitute that in, the new delta H is going to become E squared divided by M squared C squared. Plus, right? That was a minus there was a minus. So. S dot L divided by R cube. Beautiful. With so little input, 
using essentially phenomenological facts that the electron carries spin, the, the discovery of the electron spin, plus some arguments in relativity led us to an important expression, except it is larger by a factor of two than the physically physical one, physically measured one. The correct one is not the one we have derived, it is with that additional two put in. Now we put them by hand and we try to justify. The justification is, I should have warned you, I did not on purpose, because this is a very naive semi-classical argument that we are using. We don't have any intention of claiming that this is a big deal. The actual stuff is going to be the correct one will be obtained from the Dirac equation. You see this class is actually uh, someday should be converted into a relativistic quantum mechanics course by pushing all the material that we have been covering in the past and now should be to a lower level to 5 or 7. Because relativistic the Dirac equation is the relativistic quantum mechanical equation. That's a marriage of relativity and quantum mechanics. And universe is obviously based on these two principles. The victory of the Dirac equation that it predicted when it was proposed first, immediately people checked and it predicted G equals 2. It predicted all these correct is spin orbit interactions and everything. And it predicted many other things really physically measured and tested. Therefore, we have to check the trace of this mistake. It is not a mistake that the professor is stupid or something. It is the mistake of the ingredients we have used. Something, there was a swindle in it, which I, if I hidden from you, that the swindle was an important swindle, and it was only natural that we missed the correct result by a factor of two, that our, the predicted result is larger by a factor of two than the physical one. So I put that by hand, modify it, and now try to explain why there is a mistake. Why there was bound to be a mistake in that naive computation? Because of the following reason. Remember those transformation relations between electric and magnetic fields from the rest frame of the proton to the rest frame of the electron? We said, well, they, e, e and B are the components of a second rank antisymmetric tensor, therefore they should transform like the product of two four vectors. All these are correct, no problem. What is not correct is that the K prime frame is not an inertial frame. Origin of mistake. As I said, this is the mistake of everyone who is following that argument that by a factor of two that I had to modify by hand was K prime frame was not an inertial frame. but treated as an inertial frame by using Lorentz transformation. But as an inertial frame. So when you do that. Why it's not an inertial frame? Because if you tr look at it semi-classically, if it moves semi-classically, then I can use uh, classical arguments, then it moves in a circular frame, circular frame, there's an acceleration, right, towards the center, v squared over r. So it's not an inertial frame, it's an accelerated frame.
It's an accelerated frame. Therefore, I have to, uh, if I keep track of this, uh, then I can recover. I put it by hand based on experimental inputs. Now we can recover it through theoretical reasoning. And this is actually what is done by Mr. Thomas. And this phenomenon was called Thomas precession or Wigner's angle. And it's a beautiful mathematical subject in its own right in the theory of Lorentz groups and group representations. Let me repeat the basic features of the argument. I'm not, as I said, I'm not teaching relativity theory in here, so I'm not going to repeat the arguments. But those of you who wonder about the Thomas's beautiful discussion, semi-classical, it's beautiful, because some, some of my colleagues, they say, Professor, forget this. You have the Dirac equation. You can uh, extract everything from the Dirac equation. So why do you worry about such things? That's true, but we haven't discovered, we haven't used and developed the Dirac equation yet. We are still in the realm of non-relativist quantum mechanics, so we have to find hand-waving arguments to really construct those corrections to convert the naive Coulomb Hamiltonian into a realistic Hamiltonian, including all these effects. Well, Thomas has, Thomas's argument, as I said, that's Wigner's argument is similar to that one as well. It's the, it based on Wigner's angle. Is the following, these, the, for example, this frame, K prime frame, just look at it at the present moment. It is instantaneously at rest. But the next point, if you move to the next point, you are making an accelerated motion. Therefore, you cannot use really Lorentz transformations. But the catch is that this gentleman has thought of infinitely many instantaneously at rest, that is infinitesimally separated in angle infinitely many frames all aligned and then he transformed from one frame to another consequently in infinitesimal steps. Then he finds that when you modify that computation then you have the correct one half factor coming in. There's a good reference and some of you have already read, studied that reference Jackson's book Chapter 12, there is a beautiful section on the Thomas precession, and he actually discusses this particular point. Although I should confess that it is not the most pedagog pedagogical section of my old professor Jackson, it's quite a little difficult to uh, see the messages. It's a complicated issue, therefore, he is not in his best in writing that chapter. So you may have a bit of difficulty in appreciating what he was done. Read that and see how this alignment, this I innovative idea of filling it infinitesimally, infinitely many uh, instantaneously at rest inertial frames, at rest as inertial, all aligned and you, by going through from one frame to another, that you carry out two infinitesimal Lorentz, one finite and one infinitesimal transformation following it, what is the equivalent to in combined form? The question is as simple as that. If you do that, you'll see that that factor of two comes in. So, as we are going to see the correct derivation from the rigorous Dirac equation, I'm not going to push that any further. So we have the delta H2 now, which is called the spin orbit. The first one was a correction to the kinetic energy coming from relativity. This is the spin orbit interaction again coming from the relativity because as there is spin, there must be relativistic effects. And there is yet a third one on the same footing and on the same uh, order of magnitude strength. And unfortunately, but at this stage, I have no way of finding any semi-classical reasoning to justify the presence of that. It is called the Darwin's term. We are going to drive that. Some of you who have seen this, you know how beautifully complicated that discussion was, right? And I, I usually enjoy doing it, but I, I agree that some of my students don't quite of the same opinion with me. It's complicated, beautifully complicated. But when you do that, you feel that you are at the threshold of a research, right? You are doing this. 
And I have to also warn you that I, mean, I can get a little bit of credit for myself. Most of the discussions in some of the books are wrong. Therefore, this is quite original what we are doing in here. We will be doing that. So let me list that third term to complete the list. And in the next hour, I will, well, we are going to accomplish the first difficult task of finding them, but how to incorporate their effects to solve the energy eigenmany problem is another difficult problem in its own right, and we will turn our attention to that immediately. The last one is called the Darwin's term, the grandson of great Darwin. Well, they have become all great scientists following the grandfather. So P pi h bar squared e squared 2 m squared c squared delta cube r. You see how strange that term is. It acts at the origin. There is an infinite force. When you come very close to the origin, it pushes you away by an infinitely strong force. That's the Darwin term. So we have the following complete Hamiltonian then. H is H0 plus sum from 1 to 3 delta Hi. And these are the ones which I have to treat as perturbations to compute their corrections. The corrections coming from these on the energy eigenvalues on the spectrum. We will stop at the level of energy eigenvalues, but we can pursue and find the correction to the energy eigenfunctions as well. But that's enough is enough. We'll do that for the energy eigenvalues only. And we have the terms listed in here. Obviously, we have to, first of all, as in as is the case in any perturbative treatment, check that these are small as compared to what? H0, so that I can run the algorithm of per perturbation theory. Well, the first one is known, and it's obviously, I cannot say yet large as compared to these, provided that I will check that each of them is small as compared to the H0. But there is a splitting. The first one is known, quite well known. And if I can provide an argument demonstrating that the new ones are small, then I can really use degenerate perturbation theory. Why degenerate? Because this, with, together with the spin, all of them are degenerate. Even the ground state is doubly degenerate. There's spin, 2 n squared. And all the levels are degenerate, so we have to use the tools of degenerate perturbation theory. The basic principles I have already listed in the form of two statements in plain English. And when we turn the, when we turn the, use the algorithm, then you'll appreciate what those statements really actually meant. But are these really small? Delta H1 is minus P squared squared, eight M cubed, C squared. Delta H2 is E squared over twice M squared C squared S dot L H R cube. And delta H is the Darwin pi H bar squared E squared divided by twice M squared C squared D cube R. How nice. We have these three terms. I have to first check that they are indeed small as compared to H0. And what is the basis? Well, eigen, eigen states of the H0 itself. The basis is nothing more than that. Let's start with the DH1. Order of magnitude estimation. So I just be, I, I'm not going to be that careful with the tools, etc. So divided by H0 in the basis I get vector basis, therefore it's EN0 really. In that basis, there are EN zeros. That is alpha squared divided by 2N squared times MC squared, correct? So let me write the, the, the numerator, denominator, alpha squared over 2N squared times MC squared. That's the denominator. And what about the numerator? Numerator has what? This is p squared squared. 
I will use now a hand waving argument. Write this as minus p squared over 2m squared. What I have done was divided the numerator by 1 over, divided the numerator by 4m squared, correct? So I have to do the same in the, in the numerator. 8m cubed c squared 4m squared. Well, this is like the kinetic energy, right? So, minus the kinetic energy squared divided by twice m c squared. Well, you know, this way of writing is beautiful. Why? Because it, it's a consistency check. Energy squared divided by the energy is energy. If I had an ex extra factor of, of some stupid origin, then it would be a sign that I was doing a mistake. Now, it is energy squared divided by the energy is correctly giving the energy. Now, I can, uh, with that, with the help of that, I can say, what is the kinetic energy squared expectation value in that old basis using virial theorem again, up to factors of two or one half, it is the same as the EN zero squared, up to factors of twos and one halves. Please refresh your memory by doing half an hour reading on the virial theorem. So it is, perhaps I have to retain the EN zero down, and EN zero squared, you see how nice these arguments are, and divided by 2MC squared. That cancels that, so this is at the order of EN zero divided by 2MC squared. How nice. Now I can put the values in now, alpha squared over 2N squared times MC squared divided by 2MC squared mc squared cancel and I have alpha equals alpha squared over 4n squared. The mass quantum is n equals 1, so it's alpha squared over 4. That's the point, right? Up to factors of 2 or one, uh, 1 halves. So the ratio of this kinetic energy correction to the original term, the principal term, is at the order of alpha squared. Even smaller, alpha squared divided by 4. Is it small? That's indeed small, because alpha is 1 over 137. So that was rather quick and easy. Let's check the second spin orbit. And let's see, indeed, that's in the same order. Well, first of all, if they're of the same order, I can treat them nicely. If there's some hierarchy between it, would, life would be quite difficult. Small, smaller, smaller. But H0, and there is a new group of terms of the same order. They are both small at the same level, smaller as compared to H0. That's the point. OK, so let's, let me check the spin orbit now. Delta, delta H2 divided by EN0 now, I write, right? Because in that basis, H0 expectation values EN0, thus what do I have is E squared divided by 2M squared C squared. S dot L, angular momenta are at the order of H bar, right? And numbers, H bar and numbers. So that, therefore, is H bar squared divided by R cube. What is a typical R cube? Bohr radius, for instance. The R is, the expectation value of R is the size of the atom. What is the a typical measure of the atom? R A0, Bohr radius. Nice. A0 cube divided by EN0 here, which is alpha squared over 2N squared and C squared. It looks a bit complicated. Therefore, instead of trying to squeeze it in, in half a minute, Let's give a short break in here and then we'll continue after because these, these arguments are serious arguments. And Fermi-like or Feynman-like arguments are sometimes more important than the rigorous computations, right? These are beautiful hand-waving arguments. I will give the details after the short break, okay?